Welcome to this webinar on pilot recruiting and selection. We're going to talk about effective recruiting in the current environment, talk about the current state of the market, what is occurring in pilot selection, and how to use best practices to avoid hiring mistakes that increase cost per hire. Our guest speakers today are Hope Arke from PSR Aviation and Dr. Diane Demas from Demas Aviation Services. Hope, tell us a bit about your background. Hi, Jean. I'm a principal at PSR Aviation. I've been involved in pilot recruiting for regional airlines, cargo, and corporate carriers for the past six years. In that role, I've established pilot recruiting partnerships with flight schools, colleges, and universities, and have completed over 1,000 pilot interviews. 1,000 pilot interviews. Uh, Dr. Demas, hello. Tell us about your Hi. background. Yes, I have a doctorate in aviation psychology. I was a professor for 19 years, and in 1995, I left academia to found Demos Aviation Services, where I'm the president. My company does consulting for carriers of all types, and we work worldwide. And of course, I'm also on the faculty of CQFA. Now, what is a pilot recruitment, I Hope? Pilot recruitment involves all the activities involved in pipeline candidates to your organization. So that can be active recruiting of currently qualified candidates. It could be passive recruitment of future candidates who may apply at your carrier. It would include employment branding, as well as industry marketing to increase the pipeline of qualified candidates to your organization. And that familiarity of candidates with your organization would ideally result in an application being submitted to your carrier. That can involve all stages of the process from stimulating candidate interest up to an interview. So it's not just about screening out, you're involved into stimulating, attracting people to the to your clients. Yes, we want to bring as many pilots to the table as possible. What is pilot selection, Diane? Pilot selection is basically the use of various types of assessments to identify the best possible candidate for your company in a cost-effective and legally defensible manner. Traditionally, pilot selection started after everything that Hope has described finished. But today, because of changes in the technology we use in both recruitment and selection, we may do things slightly out of order. So we may do some selection before all the elements of the screening are finished. If we focus on corporate and regional airlines, what would a best practice recruitment process look like? So once the candidates have been pipelined to the organization and that completed application's been received, a recruiter is going to review that application to ensure the pilot meets the minimum qualifications of the air carrier. Then they're con going to conduct a telephone screening or perhaps a telephone interview, and they'll reject or accept candidates that would proceed to the selection stage of the process. And how long would a telephone interview or screening process last or take? Screenings are shorter than interviews. So my experience in conducting those over a thousand interviews has been a screening would be approximately 30 minutes and a full interview would be approximately 60 minutes. Okay, and back to the selection side of things, uh, what would be a best practice selection process for a corporate flight department or a regional carrier? It would start with what's called a needs analysis, and the needs analysis basically would look at the knowledge, skills, abilities, and traits that should be assessed in your particular candidates. For example, your company may be interested in hiring pilots that are very, very conscientious, or you may want pilots that have high spatial abilities. Once we'd figured out what it is we really need to assess, then we would do everything that Hope has just described, and then we would begin uh, putting assessments in place to test those knowledge, skills, abilities, and traits. Today, the best types of assessments are those that have been developed specifically for pilots, and those, unfortunately, usually require a certified administrator. Can you import a task analysis from another carrier? You can up to a certain degree, provided there's a lot of similarity between your aircraft and your procedures. 
then you can import it to a certain level. In your career, have you administered personality traits uh, testing to pilots? Yes, I have. And how long do they usually take? And uh, could you tell us a bit about their cost? Typically, they're going to take 30 to 40 minutes for online testing, which is what is normally done today. The cost will vary a little bit uh, depending on whether the company has a certified administrator or not, and also how detailed the report that uh, the company wants. So typically, these things are going to run anywhere from about $40 to about $75. Let's explore the major recruiting and selection challenges and more depth for regional airlines and uh, corporate operators, uh, Hope. The challenge is going to be to meet the recruiting goals of your carrier. So how do we attract enough pilots as few are available in the market today? And we may have to compete for candidates. So our employment branding has to be much stronger. We have to have an online presence through social media, and that social media needs to be reflective of our employment branding. We may need to be more proactive attending job fairs and visiting schools. When you say branding, Hope, is it about the industry or now it is more about an operator? Very specific to an operator, not the industry as much as it used to be in the past. So pilots are going to be attracted by different qualities now that each carrier will offer meeting their needs. Maybe a quality of life, it may be pay, it may be base location, and it may be flow through programs that would allow a pilot to progress in their career ultimately to a major carrier. Well, I can see that uh, how this increases the complexity. As far as uh, major selection challenges, for regional and corporate operators, Diane? The biggest challenge, of course, is always cost. Uh, Nobody has an infinite budget anymore these days, if they ever did. So cost is the primary driver. And then we have to think again about certified administrators. So the company may want to get one of its own people trained, which is going to cost some money, or they may want to hire someone outside to help them. We also think about ease of administration, and typically nowadays online testing, that is remote testing, is cheaper for the company than bringing people in in person and administering the tests. So most companies now are opting for this online remote testing. You're mentioning the cost. Isn't pilot selection a cost-saving issue more than an actual cost expenditure? The idea behind selection is to identify the best people, and that means there's going to be a fewer people that are going to fail training. There are fewer people that are going to need additional resources, more time to get through training, and there's going to be fewer people who are just going to run off six months into their job and join another carrier. So you're saying today carriers are sensitive to selecting out uh, potential candidates? Some of them are sensitive to selecting out. That is, you want to identify people who don't have what it is you're looking for. So if you want pilots that are very conscientious, you're going to look for those who are rather on the carefree side and try to get rid of those. Select out is and traditionally has been a very big uh, part of the selection system. Can you expand the hope on the um, obvious challenges that are related to this perceived global pilot shortage? Yeah, so in today's environment, we're finding that our search to fill our number of required hires may take longer. We're looking for pilots in areas that we previously would not have considered because there's fewer quality candidates to choose from. Such as uh, what what kind of pilots, for example? We might look at pilots previously excluded from consideration that would include pilots who have been out of the industry for some time. So they quit flying due to the downturn in the industry in the past. So now they're returning. Previously, those candidates wouldn't have been considered, or candidates who've been flying primarily in a general aviation environment who may not have developed the level of instrument flying that we would normally look for. So we're looking at all pilots in all areas and evaluating them to see if they can meet the carrier's needs. Are you more tolerant so, to some background issues? Absolutely. We're looking at background issues that previously would have disqualified candidates and can we accept those candidates? And airlines are looking at all types of new programs. Are they going to enter the ab initio market or are they going to participate in some hybrid version where they increase competition for those 
same candidates earlier in a recruitment process. So those candidates might have to commit to a specific carrier earlier in their training, therefore eliminating them from the market for the rest of the carrier. Do you still see today the training bonds that were um, um, used in, uh, let's say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Not really. Most regional carriers have done away with any type of training contract that normally would be reflective of a type rating. What we do see is if carriers are sharing some cost of pilot training, they may require an employment contract, which would not be a training bond. Okay. And and Diane, how would you expand on the selection challenges uh, in relation to this perceived global shortage? The first problem is that when you have a shortage, nobody wants to deselect a pilot. So, for example, if they make it through HOPE's screening process and interview process, it's often very difficult for management to hear that a given candidate is probably not going to be the best fit for them. So that's a serious problem. The other problem that we have frequently is the difference between skills and abilities and explaining that. Most of the time with assessments, except for personality tests, we're looking at an ability. And an ability is, you can think of it as being innate. You're not going to change it with training. What you do change with training is skill level. Somebody who has a very low level of ability can be trained up to a certain level so they can get through their check rides, etc. But they're going to lose that skill level quickly. And when they're under high workload or a crisis occurs, they may not function as effectively. So one of the things we have to do is is talk to people and make them understand about the, the difference between these skills and abilities and have them focus more on the abilities, identifying people who have the capability that they're really interested in. So they may think they're fixing a recruitment um, issue, but in fact, a problem will occur online uh, when something uh, difficult occurs in the cockpit and they won't be able to face it? Yes. Uh, a lot of times we don't see these problems surfacing until the person becomes a captain. Then when they have command authority and they have to worry about a first officer and something unusual happens, so their workload goes very high suddenly, then uh, that's when you see some of these shortcomings occurring. So loads of extra training on a pilot with low ability may not be the solution after all. It's not often the the solution. Um, in my case, for example, I have no musical ability, so I could practice and practice and practice, and I'm never going to make it to Carnegie Hall, that's for sure. Um, so if you don't have a certain level of ability, it's going to be very difficult to get them up to the correct standards. We've seen overseas ab initio programs for quite a while, and ab initio is maybe one answer to the global shortage. Uh, Hope, uh, how do you approach uh, recruiting future pilots of 16, 17 years old, uh, even through programs run by airlines or colleges? Right. The first issue probably is a cost issue because there is a natural interest and attraction to aviation. But students and their parents don't know how to get involved. They don't know what steps they need to take to start their pilot training or their education in aviation. Do you see sometimes young future pilots having a hard time to convince their parents that that this is a good career for them? Yeah, we need to help their parents understand what a pilot and his his or her lifetime earnings might be and how that compares to other opportunities that their investment in their future pilot's education really is a positive return on that investment in education. So our challenge is how do we reach these students? Visiting high schools is very timely, cost prohibitive, and it doesn't immediately face a return on that investment. So there's a lack of a profit model with that. So perhaps the solution's an industry campaign to help reach high school guidance counselors to educate them about the opportunities in aviation. And also, there's a competition for these students, not just in aviation amongst different carriers, but with other career opportunities that identify students that have an aptitude or perhaps experience of success in STEM skills. And so now you're competing with other careers that might pay higher than aviation, but they need that information. And who's going to pay for these programs? Are air carriers or industry organizations going to help offset the cost of a relatively labor-intensive activity?
So uh, competing future careers might be easier to finance than aviation. Is that what part of the problem? Absolutely. Manufacturing industry has recognized STEM skills as being vital to their success and future. So we're competing not just in aviation, but against engineers or IT professions. And the air carriers to deal with, are they sensitive to that? Are they uh, thinking of ways to help financing um, ed- education is leading to aviation? They're starting to. Um, perhaps not at the high school level, but more in the flight training and college. They're looking at tuition reimbursement programs and how they, they pipeline those students to their carrier earlier. Selecting um, active pilots is something, something we've done for decades. H- how do you approach selecting ab initio future pilots since they're not in the industry yet? That can be a challenge sometimes. Um, certainly certain types of testing that would be appropriate for an experienced pilot is not appropriate for an ab initio. So for example, certain types of knowledge tests we wouldn't ask or wouldn't be appropriate for an ab initio. There's Such no as what, uh, like a regulatory aviation knowledge, for example? Exactly. Uh, yeah. you, you wouldn't expect an ab initio to know that. Why, why should they know it? So that type of testing is not appropriate. There's other types of cognitive testing that is just not developed for someone who's 16 or 17 years old. 21, 25 maybe, but 16 or 17 would be problematic. That raises the question about why you're testing an ab initio. And everybody would like to know how good of a 777 captain is this 16-year-old going to be when they're 55? And our problem is we can't do that. We've never been able to do it, and I don't think we're going to be able to do it anytime soon. So one of the reasons for testing is, of course, general idea if they're going to make it as an airline pilot. And that brings up sort of an ethical issue. If you have people who desperately want to be pilots, but they don't have the aptitude for that, wouldn't it be better to find that out on the front side and then tell the person so that they can make an informed choice about this career path rather than simply accepting them into a program and then having them fail months later? Absolutely. And perhaps reorient this candidate to other aviation career than the cockpit. Correct. Now, we've been around for quite a while, and we know the situation is pressing us to find the right candidates. How is technology helping or affecting your work? Well, probably the big thing we're seeing on the recruitment side is the impact of social media. So every carrier has to be present on social media. Is this always good? It can be very good getting your messaging about your opportunities and your employment branding out there, what you can offer a pilot. But it might be bad because if a candidate has a negative experience with your interview process or they weren't selected, they may post negative comments that go viral and impact your carrier's reputation in the market. And based on his experience, her experience, uh, perception of the process, and then it goes. And it can be very hard to overcome. Other things that are changing is how we interact with pilots. Virtual job fairs, relatively new, less in-person interaction, so it can feel cold sometimes, but it also is an advantage because it's cost-effective. It's efficient for the carrier and the pilot, but it may require a technology investment. It reaches far, I guess, that the, you know, the communities and the, reaches the kids that are, won't be able to attend otherwise regular job fairs, right? Yes. And then in addition, in the interview process, we have new opportunities with remote video interviews. Again, they're not interactive. So a candidate answers interview questions. They record their answers and submit that with their application. So depending on how it's used, that can be very positive because it can eliminate certain types of bias as all candidates are receiving the same questions. Is technology cost effective in your world? Is it are you are you, your clients saving money actually? They can as long as they're not required to invest in technology. That's usually a, a large investment. But if the technology exists in a way that's easily taken advantage of, can be very cost effective for the carrier and the pilot since they don't have to travel to a face-to-face interview at their own cost. Okay, and is today's technology affecting selection as well? Yes, and in some of the same ways that Hope just uh, mentioned. The automated interview that we spoke about a little while ago allows a number of different people to observe the candidate. So after the candidate has come the automated interview, the tape can be forwarded to several different 
recruiters who are going to score it independently, and that allows us to get a, a variety of opinions about the quality of the candidate, and it avoids certain types of biases. So one um, interviewer might be biased against people with red hair. Well, the other two wouldn't be, so we can kind of wash those effects out. So that's that's a good thing. You can average it out, so it brings inter-rater reliability yes, in it, the process. Exactly. You can wash out the effects of bias that specific individuals may have. Well, we had that with interview boards in the past, no? If the interview was live with two or three VIP from the company, you could have that, right? You could have that, but I think the difference here is, particularly in the United States with the laws, the raters should be trained and they should be standardized. And you can't do away with all of your biases because a lot of them are unconscious, basically. But it allows us to get, um, get rid of some of them, where on the technical interview at the time, that usually wasn't the case. Uh, people weren't that trained. Does it make it uh, harder to dig into an issue that you could discover because uh, the system is all can now? Or? In a way, it does, but there should be an interview or two later if the candidate is successful. And then if you have a very experienced interviewer like Hope, then they can see certain reg flags and go after them. So you, it allows you to process a shorter list at the end of the process. That's the idea, shorter list, and therefore it becomes a more cost-effective selection system for the uh, for the company. Has technology affected the way you process the numbers once you acquire the test results? Yes, uh, there's been a lot of advances in statistics lately. So we can do a much better job now with a small company that is only going to hire a, f- a few pilots than we could 20 years ago. So um, smaller groups then? Smaller groups. Okay. Are those uh, computer-based or distant testing affordable, or it increased the cost of the process? Normally, it's dropped the cost, um, because nowadays there's no need to bring somebody in and tie up a computer room, or in some cases have an administrator standing there and giving the test to five or ten people. You can have it delivered any place in the world. The person can take it whenever they want, and usually it's quite cost-effective. Now, you're two experts based in the United States, uh, how would you compare the U.S. recruiting practices uh, with those, uh, say, in Canada or uh, some European countries? uh? Europe has a long history with ab initio selection and training, which we don't have in the U.S. and Canada, but we can learn from them. And we're starting different programs like that now. The U.S. in the past has recruited heavily from the military, but that supply of pilots doesn't exist in the same fashion it has in the past. Do they suffer from the global shortage as much as the United States suffer now? I don't believe so. Canada has more governmental involvement in the pilot hiring and training, and so they have full employment, but not a shortage. That may change. Can't predict that. But so what we're seeing is U.S. carriers now starting their own flight schools, buying a flight school, or a portion of a flight school, as European carriers have done in the past. That adds to the candidate pool, but also adds to the shortage as those students are committed to a specific carrier earlier in the career. If the shortage is not global, so if there's a glut in Canada, it's very difficult for those pilots to come to the U.S. specifically to fly because the U.S. doesn't recognize a pilot as having essential skills that would allow for immigration through the H-1B visa process. How much does U.S. law affect what you can ask during recruitment? It's very important to understand U.S. employment law. It has a big impact on what we should be asking during the interview process. We are not going to be asking questions that could lead to bias during the selection process. So we won't ask about marital status, country of origin, age, or religion. We also may not ask certain questions regarding a pilot's background until after an offer of employment has been extended. So for example, in regards to a criminal record, a carrier cannot currently ask those questions until post offer of employment. So once the background check's completed, if there is something negative in a pilot's background that would eliminate their ability to be cleared through TSA for flying, then those offers are going to be rescinded. So an employment offer first and then a background check, and then we keep or not that candidate. Correct. And that may increase cost of recruitment. Sure. And uh, I want to ask you the same type of question, Diane. How does pilot selection in the U.S 
us differ from, say, the selection in Canada or some European countries? The U.S. has always differed from uh, Europe and from Canada, at least since World War II. The Europeans and the Canadians traditionally have a much heavier emphasis on standardized testing. So they use a lot of paper and pencil, now computerized tests of math skills, spatial testing, etc., than the U.S. ever has. The Europeans particularly have always been very, very interested in personality. We have not used that in the United States until very recently because... We were just too variable. Uh, too many people from too many different backgrounds who spoke too many different native languages, and it just didn't work well for us. So those are the two ways in which we have traditionally differed from other countries. Both of you have been involved in pilot hiring for substantial periods of time, and I'm sure you have seen lots of changes. Uh, let's start with Hope. What changes have you seen in recruitment over your professional career? We have seen a lot of changes. So the reduction of qualified candidates that are eligible for hire. So we find airlines competing for pilot in a very image sensitive environment. So reputation of the carrier is essential. We're continuing to see additional changes as pilots look at carriers for what carriers can bring to their quality of life instead of what they can offer a carrier. Would you feel the manpower is more mobile now? They're willing to change employers faster or once they basically enter a um, stream they tend to stay? Possibly. So if they're at a carrier that doesn't have great quality of life or a quick captain upgrade to progress their career, they are more willing to change carrier. However, if a carrier offers flow and consistent career progression from student pilot to certified flight instructor to regional pilot to major airline pilot, they're willing to stay with that carrier. Okay, now how different it is for you, Diane, today in the selection world uh, from what it was uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago? Uh, there's been a lot of changes. Uh, of course, this remote testing is new. That's only come really in the last five years where I can send an email to a candidate in Hong Kong and have them perform the test in Hong Kong. The automated testing where there's no human interaction with the candidate is also quite new. And the other thing that's new is what I would call internationally validated tests. So we have tests developed in the United States and they can be administered to Chinese pilots, Russian pilots, South African pilots and have the same predictive validity, the same power for predicting how well the person is going to do as a pilot. That's new. Uh, typically we've only developed tests just by Americans for Americans and that's changed radically over the last few years. Now you've been talking about distance testing. Uh, does that bring new issues about security, for example, ID validation? It does. Uh, most of the companies that currently offer this distance testing are very, very aware of security. So they have very high levels of security on their systems. Of course, it is always an issue. You see face recognition uh, being uh, brought into the system eventually to make sure the candidates are who they are? And uh, absolutely. Uh, that will come. Now, you've described pretty well the changes that occurred in your career. How would you see your work in five years from now, Hope? It's hard to predict. It's a very dynamic environment. We're seeing changes in the recruiting landscape about every six months. As carriers look to increase pay, increase signing bonuses, and the benefits that they offer pilots, and we're seeing that go beyond airlines into cargo carriers and on-demand carriers. We're also seeing perhaps a, a continued move towards ab initio as we get closer and closer to that in the U.S. So I think we'll see additional carriers providing reimbursement for a portion or all of a pilot's training cost in exchange for a commitment for future employment. I think we could see some additional changes in the industry that might be carriers filing for bankruptcy. They could cease operations or be in a merger situation due to the lack of available pilot. Do you see a trend of merging or, or collaborating because of the global shortage? Yes, we're seeing 
some of that as major airlines continue to develop code share partnerships outside of the traditional regional model in the U.S. So they're forging those code share partnerships with charter carriers and on-demand air carriers, which does initially expand the pipeline of pilots from operations that might not have previously been considered, but perhaps they are locking up that new supply of pilot because they're putting them in a flow to a future employment situation with the air carrier. I guess it could lead to autonomous flying, you know, pilotless cockpits. Perhaps. You know, it will be curious to watch. Does autonomous flying develop and does that free up previously engaged pilots to fly for other carriers? Or are we going to look at other out-of-the-box solutions? Are we going to consider sharing pilots amongst carriers, whether it's in a corporate or a passenger environment. Diane, how do you see pilot selections in five years from now, including the legal framework? I think, first of all, we're going to see an increase in distance testing. It's cost-effective. It's good for the candidate. They can take a test wherever and whenever they want. It's cost-effective for the company, so I think that's going to keep going. Is there a future to simulator-based testing? I think we'll keep that in some cases, but that's very late in the selection process because of the cost. I think what we're going to see more of is this automated testing where there's no human involvement with it. As to the employment law, I don't see any immediate changes in the actual employment laws occurring over the next few years, but we do have changes in how the government agencies interpret and act, that is, enforce those laws. So those can change, and they can change sometimes fairly quickly. Because we have this pilot shortage, we will be looking, I think, more overseas And we do have uh, carriers overseas who want to use U.S. tests. So what we're seeing is an increased interest on the part of the test developers for international usage. So that means now that a U.S. company might develop a pilot selection test not only for Americans, they're going to develop for, for Russians, South Africans, maybe Japanese. So it's going to be developed and validated so it can be used worldwide rather than just for Americans. Both of you have been actively engaged for many years with carriers of all sizes, and you stay on top of industry trends. What services do you offer to flight operations and or HR personnel? Dr. Mark Rose and I have developed an online course that deals with the technical, that's sometimes called the captain's interview, and this, of course, is offered through CQFA. I also have a two-day pilot selection course, which I teach through CQFA. Uh, Hope and I are are finishing an uh, online course that is specifically dealing with distance interviewing. And, um, of course, we have a, there's a variety of resources available on our websites for people who would like to look. We do HR consulting for carriers of all sizes, and uh, people should feel uh, free to contact uh, Hope or me anytime. And I'll put your coordinates on the screen. So it was great to have you today. Two experts in pilot recruitment, pilot selection with years of experience. You're based in the U.S., but your perspective is international. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope Harkey, Dr. Diane Demos, thank you so much. You're most welcome. Thank you.